Well, hopefully today's interview is the first of many we'll do throughout the rest of the indoor season and even some of them hopefully after. But we've been talking for our last few reaction videos. We're going to try to get some some design related people for the various shows and the activity, especially in the independent world class um, arena, just on to, to break their shows down. Tell us what they're about, where the idea came from, talk about the music, the arranging choices. But and that first one's today is Shane Gwaltney's on with us today. Evan, I'll let you take it uh, for a second here. And then, well, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to the Aged Out Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Michael Fantini, and with me, as always, is... Evan Worrell. And I'll let Evan introduce our guest here in a minute, but if you're listening on podcast services, head over to YouTube, comment, like, subscribe there, share the interview and video with anyone you think would appreciate it, follow on Facebook and Instagram, go to patreon.com slash agedoutpodcast, or the join button right on YouTube if you want to support us financially. Now, there we go. Evan, go ahead. Yeah, so joining us, obviously, from uh, Nashville, uh, a man who's been with... Music City Mystique since its inception, I believe, a charter member since 1995, but uh, joining us, Mr. Uh, Shane Gwaltney. Thanks for coming to hang out, man. Howdy. Thanks for inviting me. I'm pumped. No, we yeah, man. So you guys time. are year 30, right? It is. It is year 30. And I feel like if I blink, it's uh, going to be another 30. Like it, it feels <laughs> like it goes by and it did go by really quick. So, man, that's a lot of shows, uh, a lot of designing i'm sure over the career that you've been with them a lot of just different roles obviously built into the role that you are now um take us back a little bit just to to jump since you guys are an anniversary year with indoor in 1995 versus <laughs> where we are now my god uh, do we have enough time here um <laughs> yeah I, I say uh the first five years i marched mystique was our, our existence, 95 to 99, aged out 99. And in those five years, in that even that short amount of time in our 30, right, I saw groups go from band uniforms and Shakos. Uh, there was mainly, all the independent groups typically were an affiliate of a drum corps, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, because it's really hard to get an independent group going mm -hmm. at that time, that was probably the, the best and most secure way to do one. And those groups were typically the ones that had the core uniforms or were borrowing marching band uniforms and that kind of thing, where independent groups that were popping up that were truly independent, like Mystique and uh, I think eventually like Carolina Thunder and things like that, uh, we didn't have an affiliation, so we basically begged, borrowed, and still for our uniforms, right? So we didn't, so I think costuming wise, we evolved pretty quick because that was our only choice, right? We didn't have the option of having. Um, a core back uniform. And uh, so I think that probably started a little bit of the evolution. And then of course, within those few years, like blue Knights, they mm. didn't wear the uniforms anymore after mm -hmm. like 95 or maybe 96, something like that. They kind of got out of that. So weeders was one weeders was part of phantom oh, yeah. at the time. So yeah, they wore their core uniform out there. They didn't wear the Shakos, but they, they definitely had the, um, the, 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 the black uniform. So but yeah, I think in that short amount of time, you just saw a lot. And then, uh, of course, you know, out of that, you got sound design and then, you know, all the visual elements that are going on now. But yeah, I mean, it's um, quite different now than what it was. <laughs> but you also got to remember back then, we had, I think, the first couple years I marched, there was only seven independent groups. There yeah, weren't PASIC was still very yeah, PASIC heavily... was very big at the time. Yeah. Yeah, and, and a lot of groups are same type of model as that visually you know and um as things over time changed you know you had the pace of groups i remember uh they would wear pins that said uh chops not props <laughs> you know because <laughs> uh, i competed with uh well i was an mtsu at the time when they came uh pace that came to nashville so i got to do that a couple different times but but just <laughs> meeting all the different people from different colleges it was kind of like their their motto for that but um i thought it was funny at the time but it's pretty funny it's um, pretty funny now <laughs> yeah it, it is funny uh because there's definitely groups nowadays that uh definitely got the chops you know for sure but, you know back in the day we didn't we played like doo-doo i mean we just did you know like the visual element was ahead more ahead than the playing department you know <laughs> And then eventually things started to catch up. In and then WGI we had, you know, versus PASIC, you mean? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. WGI, yeah, yeah. WGI, like it, there weren't very many well playing groups in the beginning. And if you did, like you won handedly, you know, <laughs> right, right. You, you stuck out pretty good, but um, per capita, the quality wasn't you know, as what it is now, mm -hmm. you know. Well, and then, uh, and of course, I think like my third year in 98, maybe there was like an independent class that was introduced, you know, then it was like seven groups in this class, seven groups in another. So just to see over the years, like all the, uh, the development of, you know, of course, the three classes and then the participation across the country to me is pretty, pretty wild. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the fact that there's finals where people don't make it <laughs> you know like that didn't happen for a long time it was a good 10 or 15 years of just if you come you're going to be in finals you know well, that even has um, evolved since when evan and i were marching i mean there yeah. was only two nights instead of three in 2012 right evan there was semis uh, and finals there i can't remember but i remember also finals used to be just 12 and yep. then they're like no we're gonna bump to 15 oh um, no absolutely it was 12 for the longest time and then uh yeah, I mean, it went to three days here recently. Probably, like, I mean, all the all these years are running together. What ten years ago, you said y'all mm -hmm. competed. When y'all were competing, it was only two nights. You're saying, yeah, I think it was. It was. It yeah. was just prelims yeah. and finals. Yeah, and that was 2012. Yeah, right. So, but uh, yeah, things have moved pretty fast. I mean, technology fuels a lot of innovation, which is which is really awesome. Um, and obviously, from a design standpoint, now you are one of the cogs in that uh, in that wheel. I know there's like Matt Jordan and Daniel Brown, CJ Brown. I looked off the website; those guys that do a lot of this stuff too. Front art direction, sound design is huge, obviously. Um, and then kind of jumping forward to just recent years before we get into per se this year's show design. Um, Post COVID, I mean, you guys came out with the Hell or High Water show, um, the Plastique show, and then this show. Which, honestly, all three of those, as a viewer for me and a spectator, which is cool, are very drastically different um, from one another. I think when you listen to them, they all have a similar, you know, kind of vibe, just because of the writing styles. Like you guys have your writing styles. You can tell it's a mystique as, arrangement. You can tell as far mystique, as like the the like shows themselves. Finished, sorry. Yeah. I'm stepping on you. Go ahead, Evan. That's all right. But as far as like the shows themselves, it's been cool to see just like bouncing around and like, hey, we're going to go a and do something different instead of just like being in this mold. For you guys and your design process, does that start at a specific point? Does it kind of stay rotating all season? Like you're you're currently in the, the red line show, but you're already like, well, I'm going to this is an idea. I'll save that for later. How does that look like for you guys? Yeah, Um for us or for me personally because uh, i i'm the one who typically presents most of the ideas and we kind of bang a gavel and start to produce some things but it initially we're just trying to get through this year mm -hmm. we're definitely not thinking about next year right now um any uh creative energy that i have in this year definitely goes into further developing what we're doing right now because we do start a little bit later than some groups at times. So like we need as much time as we can. We're squeezing it out as we're kind of going through. But, but as far as like being different, like, you know, we're, we are kind of traumatized a little bit because when we, you know, <clears throat> there's several groups that don't exist anymore than, Oh, of a dog than, um, <laughs> than what was around. Right. At the time. You know, there she is. Jenny, we'll say hello. No, she don't. She's with <laughs> Yeah. Um, but the, the thing that we, you know, I feel like I'm traumatized about for so long is I feel like for 15 years straight or more, maybe 20 years, uh, we would get, you know, we'd go to a show and then one of the first things they would say is, you know, you, you sound like last year, you look like last year, you know, like that kind of thing. So like every year, like if, I'm always zagging. We may zig this year, next year we're going to zag. We're just going to do something completely different because that's the kind of comments that we would get. And um, to be so, frank, I want to hear other people's tapes in the activity. To you're see not the only person that we've heard say that, that we've had <laughs> yeah. on here. Yeah, yeah. In, in, no, exactly. So like when you see Mystique and we're so different every single year, it's because of that. They don't say that t to us anymore. But, you know, definitely they would compare us to ourselves every single year. Maybe mm -hmm. it was due to a lack of competition. I don't know at the time, but like it was, 
it was concerning, you know, so, but, but, but even then, like, why would you want to create the same thing every year? You know, you, your brand is your people that are writing, right? Right, right. So no matter what kind of show we do, we're already going to have an essence to us that is going to be consistent. So if we're not trying like hell to like reach further boundaries and do different stuff, then we will be sucked into really just a, a really tight bound um, imagery, audio, you know, like it's, it's, that's not what we should do to further the activity, you know, because right. like if you're in world class, you have a duty to push the envelope. And if you're not doing that, then go somewhere else, you know? Yeah. And in order to be able to do that, you have to do something different every year. And, you know, I love throwing spaghetti against the wall because sometimes things stick really well. Some things mm -hmm. don't, you know, yeah. and and one of the other things is like a match only really strikes once. Once it's burnt, you can't go back and light that thing again. So there's a lot of groups that will, they catch fire with something and they want to replicate it again and they double again. They double down. And again. Yeah. And you just, you just you've, seen that in drum corps. you've seen that in drum corps where a group wins with a show, wins a gold medal. And it's like, oh, well, like Crown did it with uh, 2010. I think there was, uh, I feel like there's been a couple that have done like sequel shows and they were competitively very Cadets, successful. Oh, Cadet, five, oh, six, yeah, yeah, Crown, oh, nine to 2010, yep. we did it. Um, and it's, yeah. it's interesting also to hear you say it was a conscious decision to try to do something very different each year because of the um, adjudication comments you were getting on tapes and in critiques and everything. Because that was one of the questions I wanted to make sure we asked you was like, because you all do have a very, in my opinion at least, and I think Evan has also parroted this in the past of like mystique does not fit a mold i said i said earlier you can hear it in the writing and the arranging like that's that's a mystique musical package you can tell even if it, it's just like certain calling card things it's not that the music sounds the same every year but just the it's way like it's Paul, arranged right? you close your yeah, eyes you you're can like, tell it's Rennick, tell Paul. as you just know but you're all shows your uniforms the approach like very very different every year and that's one of the things i've always respected about you all is because you have some groups in the activity that either find one thing that works and just keep doing it till it doesn't and that that goes even at the top of the activity in the middle yeah. at the bottom like and i think the top groups do have a responsibility to innovate and take risks because it's almost i think we've said on here before the middle of the pack groups might not have the caliber of talent the caliber of players that even if the show idea doesn't click completely because they took a risk the playing is going to be such high level you're still going to be competitive in the conversation at the top even if the show didn't Absolutely. quite hit the mark but if you're in 16th place and you're trying to make finals again next year you're not going to have the luxury competitively because you want your members to be on the floor finals night so i think that's a responsibility just to piggyback on what, what you said earlier of those um higher achieving out of whatever the right word right would be, so, groups. right so one of the things that I take into account now more so over the last 15 years, okay? Our first 15 years of existence, we could get away with certain things playing wise because our show design was maybe above average, right? At times. Mm -hmm. Well, now every group plays really well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what I do when I'm, when I'm approaching our shows every year is making sure we have that and factor, right? We're going to play well. We're going to move well. So are the other groups. And we're going to play better. So we're going to play worse. But ultimately, we want to have that and. What is that and thing that we're doing that's either a visual effect, it's an emotional effect, it's, it's a prop that we're using? Like, what is that and that you know, your Meemaw, your Aunt Lucille, Cousin Timmy, like all of them, when they leave the audience, not you and your five best friends that understand, you know, drums in a gym. Right, right. But the entertainment factor, what are those people when they walk away and they text their family member or their friend? Oh, you should have saw whatever that was, you know? And, and that's the type of stuff that I like to think about because you can build shows around the simplest thing and make it, bigger than the arena that you're in. Right. Right. Especially right. if it's different enough and unique enough, you know, um, because I know for a fact, our design team is strong. We're going to create and design whatever, you know, like, like, like you said, we have that essence, we have that brand about us. And, um, 
It just kind of is what it is. And a lot of the top groups, they all have that too, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's not like they're having to learn how to design things at the world-class level. You're just trying to find these concepts that, um, that are going like to work. You can bring, yeah. You, that you can bring to life and mm -hmm. most importantly, connect with the audience. Cause if you're not, if you're just writing music or doing a cool show, because we all like to run and drum, but you don't have that one unique thing in the show that really sets it up. Then you just, then it's just drums at a gym. Yeah. You right. know, so like, what can you do to separate yourself from the pack? And, and to me, I've found success, whether we are successful on paper, the success, success of the program, the consistency of it comes from just being different. You have to mm -hmm. be, you know, and, um, and, and I do take pride in that because that, that is, it's a hard thing to do. Right. Oh, definitely. For but, sure. And, and the one thing that people, it's okay to be different, but you have to still stay within your wheelhouse, right? Like, for instance, we're not going to do a funny show. So even though that we can come up with an idea, sometimes our design staff might be like, well, I don't know, that seems, that might come off a little hokey. And I'm like, has any of us done anything like that? The answer is no, <laughs> no matter what, right? So there's already a barrier of where our brand is, where we're yeah. not going to go. Like, for instance... I would always help out Father Ryan, right, with their visual program. I didn't design their shows because I can't. Like, that was their identity <laughs> and their personality as a staff to make those shows come alive. All right. I did was make sure they were in the right place at the right time on the floor to do that. Right. But I didn't come up with those ideas. I could just help them construct it, you know. Mm -hmm. But yep. but that's not in my wheelhouse. Like, I would never be able to do a show like that with Mystique because that's not what I do, you know. Nor do we have the staff to pull that off mm -hmm. so i think even if you are being creative you still have to operate within your bounds of success that makes know? sense otherwise yeah you might take too far of a left turn and nobody knows how to drive that car and then you're just well, you're i think that's you know i think that's a great thing that anybody at any group at any level can latch onto here from what you just said about staying within your wheelhouse and understanding who you all are as designers because i've Obviously, we just had this whole discussion about innovating when you're at the top of the activity. You kind of have a responsibility to do that. You can take those risks and, and, and show new things that other groups could emulate. But be careful when you're those other groups trying to emulate that stuff. If, if the innovation's out of your design wheelhouse, it's probably not going to come off well. It might, but just know it's a big risk. I mean, I, I can think of a bunch of groups at the top of my head past 15 years that – a group somewhere in the activity has a lot of success and you see the very next two or three seasons, other ensembles just try to almost emulate exactly the vibe and approach that successful group took. And it's like, well, you might be able to integrate some elements of that, but you don't have the design experience of that design team. You don't have the personality, the create, like the creative, uh, that's the wrong way to say it, but like, you know what I mean. Not, like, if you're not ahead. good at implementing lights and shows, don't use lights. Exactly. If you're not good at building props, don't build props. Like you know, What's this, this production ability, <laughs> yeah. right? And, and the ability to produce an audio moment like you've heard from another group, you know, right? And that the danger in that is if you know. Let's just say hypothetical mystique. We did hell and high water. That was like our brand. We just did country, Southern hillbilly stuff for five years. Right. <laughs> and then all of a sudden all these A-class groups started doing something similar, wearing overalls, doing banjo music, doing that. And all of a sudden they dilute our brand and we're not effective anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, I think the goal of every, you know, if you're trying to be a trendsetter, you need to be making sure that you're not anchored enough into your trends that people can just surround you with your own smell and your own brand. <laughs> right, right. Because once you do that, you're not going to be effective anymore, right? Yeah, you'd that... hate to come on the floor at a show in a regional and like two groups in PIW or PIO or like Scholastic World or PIA or whatever, like did something and played the same music. And then you come on and like, well, this is the fifth time we've heard this today. Yeah, your uniqueness is now gone. <laughs> what, what made you unique three seasons ago is now that moment is past. You know what I mean? It is. Right. And that's, that's, that's the whole, you know, <clears throat> match can only be struck once type of thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, you know, 
I'll tell you every year we'll start off a design meeting or I'll have a list that says things that I cannot do because we did them this year or like three year within the last three to five years or whatever. And, and that'll really guide some discussions, right? Mm -hmm. like, like for instance, like we know that we do pretty well with lights, right? So, but I also know that we do it so much that it's not effective. Okay. And so this year I made sure that we toned it down quite a bit until where we needed it the most. So some of that is like, yeah, we've got this muscle over here. Let's use it all the time. And it wasn't necessarily the right thing. I mean, it's, I've loved everything we've done in the, since 2016 when we first started doing it this heavy. Um, I've loved everything we've done. I wouldn't change anything, but like as we're going through these next design efforts, I'm, I'm a little more conscious of it. So like, for instance, like this year, we're just using red lights throughout 95% of the show. We're not even using any other color except for that until the end. We'll, we'll change it up a little bit, but, um, but yeah, let's, so. let's transition. That was a great yeah. segue. So this year's show title, The Red Line, what was the kind of inspiration or drive behind this concept? What is the concept? Uh, yeah, we'll just jump in. Yeah. So, you know, it's the 30th year. Um, we don't necessarily like doing shows about ourselves or anything like that, but we felt it was an appropriate time to do uh, a show where we can celebrate and pay homage to artists in the past that have broken the boundaries for other people to follow. So in other words, we, it could be music, it could be uh, Elvis getting uh, uh, censored from the waist down mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, John Cage 433 just, control and silence you know what i'm saying so a lot of avant-garde stuff that we've put in the show that were boundary pushers at certain times of those people's careers so uh, aerosmith and run dmc the first time rock and rap kind of merged together we've got a moment in there about that uh we have uh an nwa moment where a lot of the clearly words are beeped out so that's kind of the effect <laughs> Yeah, censored on that. Uh, an Elvis like lower body moment where we're, you know, dancing like Elvis. And we have uh, a dance team this year. Uh, they, they call themselves the Mosh Pit. They're very talented, um, which is really cool because we, we, we really lucked out and got seven really talented movement um, folks. And um, to be able to use them in the way that we want versus, you know, we're expecting to get either drummers or a brass player that's wanting to move and do movement which is totally great but like we were able to get a, a different kind of talent so we're we're using that which is really good and um and they are the red line through parts of the show you know we're mm -hmm. breaking through those things and uh, so the red line and, being the boundary being broken by all these things that you're paying homage to that did that in in their correct in yeah, various yeah, medium yeah. exactly so we're using like red stanchions that pull out uh the red lights uh the way the dancer's uniform is they're arms are red plus across the chest so they can kind of create different lines and extension of the props or extension of the fabric that they're pulling out or they become the red line in different spots but the um, floor we try itself to too. yeah yeah exactly yeah so we try to use moment all the elements that we have in the show to kind of break through um to to visualize that that coordinates with musical elements that are happening um but there's you know, we pay homage to Nina Simone, a uh, famous black artist that she did um, um, Feeling um, Good. Yeah, right? Feeling Good. Yeah. So, and uh, people think, oh, yeah, Michael Buble is like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Go back a little bit further than that. Right. So, um, we, we try to put some really nuanced stuff in there. Some things may feel a little more nuanced. Some things might be in your face, like the NWA thing or the Elvis stuff is really easy to grab a hold of. We've got a section in there where we break silence and we play. Um, hey, Jeffrey, what's up? Um, <laughs> Jeffrey and Jimmy. The, uh, yeah, Jeffrey. Jeffrey doesn't get on camera much because he doesn't sit still long enough, but he's, they're probably hungry here in a bit. But um, yeah, poor Jenny. No, she's, let's shout. Move. Jeffrey, get down. Sorry. <laughs> You're fine. Um, sorry. Uh, what was I talking about? Help me out here. Uh, 
the NWA stuff is more blatant Elvis. And then you have oh, yeah, uh, Michael yeah, Bublé yeah, feeling stuff. good. Yeah, Michael Bublé. We do uh, uh, some Eminem in there, like the uh, Godzilla rap, like really fast and articulate, goes with a snare, like it's really cool. And then uh, out of the silence section comes, we, we break that silence with the Yoko Ono scream. Have y'all seen that? Like basically she's, it's one of her like art pieces that she does where she like, she hollers. You should Google it on YouTube. It's, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Anyway, so that is in there as part of our uh, avant-garde type stuff. Um, Speaking of like bomb. crossing the barrier, and this is these crazy videos I've seen them on like Instagram reels or TikTok or something like the people that are playing like the snare drums and they're just like rolling around on like the table and stuff. <laughs> Have you seen those? I'm just gonna yes, it's not quite there. as long guard as that, but yeah, <laughs> it's. It's in the same vein as that, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, there's a little snippets of, um, um, you know, Stravinsky, Rite of Spring in there, you know, the original Bad Boy music. So there's that type of stuff that's kind of woven in and out. And, um, well, there she is. When you guys are designing um, and going through, are you kind of – brainstorming on key moments that you want to have happen and then you eventually go back and try to put them into an order um do you pick out certain visual things first certain musical things first a little bit of both well every year is a little different this year i think we chose the music first and then i went through and started putting ideas and elements to certain things um like for instance the elvis one i knew we weren't going to play much of that music because of how it relates to our idiom but I could totally use it as a choreographed moment that fits over top of it a little bit. And then it really transfers over to the NWA. So during the NWA stuff, the dancers are actually doing the Elvis thing underneath it. So we got some kind of contrasting ideas with that. Um, but, but yeah, initially we'll have like a grab bag of ideas and then I'll take it and I'll put it into a timeline. So that my spreadsheet of a timeline will look like uh, maybe the production of like how you might do a movie or something like that at first. It'll be like the first 15 seconds. So I want it to, uh, this is the concept of this. And then I'll, this is the music idea and the visual idea, what we're doing from 15 seconds to 45 seconds. I want the snares in playing with sound design and yada, yada. So I'll go through and map out a seven minute show just like that all the way through there that has those moments already plugged in. And then when CJ gets a hold of it, he will sketch it all out in logic first. So sound design, he'll do some battery stuff in there, but mainly the keyboard stuff is also written initially by CJ with the sound design. And then once we all okay it, <clears throat> we like it, <clears throat> excuse me, and then it gets sent to me and Matt Jordan to arrange um, with that idea. And then once that happens, then I put the visual on and then we're cranking. You guys, so, when you before you ever start arranging, you kind of have a general idea of like how long I need to live in this timeline of this musical idea, um, kind of to know how to already phrase it. I need to build this for it's that long before you even put a pen to paper. Pen to we'll paper. say right, exactly, yeah. absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, and that's what it looks like. They the arrange like CJ. He can look at the full timeline. And it'll have like twenty different lines in it. And each one of them, in other words, I might have like four or five of them that are all, there's like four moments going in one idea, but it'll be, I'll color coordinate them, you know, so that these five things are one musical idea so that he knows that every 10 or 15 seconds, he's not changing a theme. You know, it's technically the intro. It just has uh, a mood setting moment. It's got a snare break. It's got a transition phrase. It's got an impact. The intro makes sense. And then I'll go, I'll put an applause point in there and then I'll put in the next idea and then we'll do that. So, so you guys um, really do way, a lot of pre-planning going into the staging process or the drill learning process or even the music arranging process. So you all do a lot in advance and then tweak as you, obviously you're going to put certain thing, you see it on the floor. It's like that 10 seconds doesn't work well, or that transition is actually kind of awkward in practice, but so you guys do a lot of creative planning ahead of time beyond show concept and music in terms of also the flow of the show. And then you put it all on and then tweak as you go along as needed. Is that a, a kind of a way to summarize it? Yeah, there's a lot of planning with 
maybe a visual concept or an mm -hmm. idea or a cinematic imagery that I want to get across. Right. So I'll have that or like, hey, I want to create a lot of motion here. I'll have that as like a visual idea or, hey, let's focus on this one individual that's going to put the pin on the donkey on the prop or whatever. <laughs> you know, like I'll yeah. have like those kind of like ideas set up. And then just so that when we write the music and I get ready to do it visually, I already kind of know what the music was intended to do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, definitely a lot of planning with the music side of things up front. And and I learned that probably I've been doing the timeline stuff for probably 15 or 20 years because initially we would write a tune and the front ensemble ranger or me, we would get going and like realize, holy crap, this has been two minutes and we haven't had an impact or we haven't right. had this moment or do whatever. And it's just because you're just writing, trying to create good music, and you're yeah. not really realizing the idiom that we have to really compete in. Yeah, you know? the music might work so, by itself really well, but the pacing within the context of an indoor drumline show might not translate. Sure, exactly. And, like, back in the day, <clears throat> we would have, like, time, param time parameters. Like, don't go 45 seconds, don't go a minute and a half without an impact or a hit. And now that time is way shorter. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like 30 seconds or less now. And if you can get two of them in 30 seconds, it'd be great. So, and it's just because the nature of society or where we're at, like flipping through your phone for three second yeah. reels over and over again. And we all laugh and joke about our attention span, but that attention span, it, it, it it's real. It's a real thing. It's, it's real. And it's a society thing. And it's not just like, Oh, the kids, it's it's adults. It's everybody. It's everybody. It's like what you can stand to digest for certain periods of time, and if you're not trying to think about how to reach the masses in that idiom, then you're not doing the right thing, you know. And that's why I think sound design is so important right now. And I know there's like circuits around the country, marching band wise, that are trying to like evolve quicker, I guess, mm -hmm. to match that. But. The sound design really connects the audience to the show quicker than anything else because the sound, because everybody spends their whole day listening to overproduced music on the radio, yeah. right? Right. So, and all of a sudden you go to a live performance and without sound design that we have in our show, and we're listening to these raw acoustic instruments that we're trying to fill up a symphonic idea with thinking big, big, you know, like really thin sound. <laughs> keyboard. It doesn't really sound as full. Right. 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 So, um, having the sound design in there really allows the common Joe to get into our shows a lot more than like knowledgeable people. Right. And I yeah, would even say have... knowledgeable people too. Cause like, even as someone who like loves this activity and appreciates pretty much everything I see, just cause I, I do understand how much work and prep and effort goes into all these shows. There are still like, even when I'm watching some, I'm just like, all right, I'm, this is a, this is a lull. Like we hit up, we bogged I, down. Like I, it's so. I, right. It's and, and, and that's, and that's hard to do as designers. Like sometimes when we watch things, we see it for what it needs to be versus what it is in the moment. And sometimes we confuse the amount of time it took us to write something versus the amount of time it happens in real life. Mm -hmm. you know true and 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 that's a big one where you know you know i used when i was young and i was like writing you know just trying to figure it out right just writing a lot because the only way you can get better at something is like in mass like do a lot of something and i i remember i would be writing music and it'd just be like i'd be like dwelling over one bar for like a damn hour dude and like I was like, what is going on? So now what I do is when I see the full score and as a sketch in Sibelius, I'll go through and I'll write quarter notes everywhere I want somebody to play. Don't even think about vocabulary. I just literally insert 16 counts, 32 counts worth of quarter notes so that I can visually see, hey, the snares are going to hold court here for 30 seconds, for 25 seconds, 64 counts, whatever it is. And then I can see stacked quad and bass and cymbal parts in a full ensemble moment. I don't know the vocabulary, it doesn't matter, but I can see mm. the pacing at a glance of the weight of the visual and the music at the same time without worrying about getting in the nuts and bolts, right? Mm -hmm. And then once I get in there, then I can look at that 16 count phrase and go, I don't care what they're doing these four counts. I need to think about what the idea is over 16 counts. 
And sometimes I'll just pick a vocabulary. Cool, we're just going to wear out floppy flams. For these 16 counts, that is our skill set. Heck and yeah. we're going to knock it down. Or it's going to be pair little diddles or do whatever, you know. Because think about, you know, I say as simple as it was, but like early cadets, when they won all those drum trophies year in a row and they want the same damn drum solo every year, right? And, you know, <laughs> fast the, rolls, the PDDs, and yeah, it set up and it was like this repeating idea that everybody could buy into because you could digest it, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and too often as arrangers, we want to change the lick up every count or do something, but there's really something to that formula and how it generates effects and how people react to what you're doing. And I think that has to do with just repetitiveness, repetitiveness, right? That's why educators, we repeat ourselves, yeah, you know, a lot, you know, to get it across. And you have to do that with music too, because it's the same is, communication, right? This is hilarious. You're talking about sometimes you, as an arranger, you feel like you need to change it up all the time, new rhythms, new rudiments, sometimes repeating it. How many times have we watched an indoor drumline show or a drumline book and they just play fast, freaking hertas for three bars straight and like slowly crescendo them and the audience goes nuts because you're appreciating and digesting what's actually happening and it's building yeah. on top of itself and it's volumes increasing this is hilarious because i just watched dartmouth show this year for the first time yeah. and there is a moment where they just freaking play fast as hell tom monk's hertas for three four bars straight and it's effective as hell and it's cool as shit to listen to I like sent it's... that link to Mike and another friend of ours. I was like, in Tom Lee Trust, I was like, he, yep. they're always just going to come out and they're going to play. Right. And, and it goes I to... think the word you said, digestibility, is so important because like every, every bass line almost in the country these days can play the wildest crap you've ever heard. But sometimes you're like, I don't even know what it was. Like, was it, it hard? comes was and it goes cool? so fast. <laughs> you can't digest it. There yeah. was something in, uh, it might have been Infinity Show that we just watched, or it might have been Broken City. I don't remember this year. Something came and went so quickly that I was, you almost can't appreciate it. Like, you always, unless you can rewind watching on a video to like, all right, here's the one second mark where the two counts of whatever the hell that was happened. And a judge isn't, doesn't have that luxury. A judge in a show adjudicating, like, effect. That might be the coolest two counts in the world, but it happens once for a millisecond. And it's like, it might give you a weird curveball to your ears, but you can't really process what just happened exactly. and appreciate how difficult it probably was. Yep. So think about, if y'all can remember these two specific examples, is either 97 Crossman, like they did the diddles down and then the singles up, the same rhythm, diddles, and then a different sticking, the hair to sticking. So that's one example of that. The other one would be Glassman probably around the same time with the flams down, decrescendo, crescendo. I think that was 99 idea. maybe. Yeah, that sounds right. Like yeah. That. So, but though, again, simple cadets idea. They did a few years after that, but like in the shorter segment, like the flams up and down, the vocabulary of that. So, um, of the singles and doubles, whatever the Crossman group did, but um, but just taking that concept when you're writing music to be able to deliver something that people can appreciate, because if you know, like you're saying, if you're playing something, it goes by so quick and you're on to the next thing, you you can't really <clears throat> appreciate those moments. Now, during musical ideas where you're really trying to um, you know, have conversations with the voice and you're mm -hmm. trying to kind of get in there. That's a different story. But if you're right. really trying to lay something home where you want to put that vertical moment, the exclamation point, like the, the photo in time that everybody remembers, mm -hmm. um, you, you gotta, you gotta have those moments. And that's how I describe like horizontal versus uh, vertical orchestration is horizontal is, you know, you can have a horizontal phrase that actually is a vertical moment because there's something really cool going on during that 30 seconds to get you to the big one. Mm -hmm. You know, a cool visual ripple or transition that gets you somewhere. That can be an isolated vertical moment. But, like, once you hit that vertical moment, it needs to be that snapshot in time that, again, the me, Ma, Cousin Timmy, Aunt Lucille, everybody's like, oh, I remember that, you know. <clears throat> and it doesn't always have to be something big. It can just be something coordinated and neat, you know. And... um I think that's so. a huge concept for designers to keep in mind if we want the audience for our activity and art form to grow. Because I've always said this forever, that we have a large barrier to entry 
to really appreciate what's going on. You've got to like my parents went to so many drum corps shows when I was marching indoor. I'd talk to them after my, my siblings. They'd be like, honestly, the last like eight groups, they all sounded incredible. Like I couldn't, nobody's ears are trained enough to get into the minutia of a snare line clarity or what, whether bass drum rhythms are, are perfectly even or slightly off. Like they, they can't process that. But the, the, what you're talking about, if you focus more on digestibility and like cool, doing cool things that others can appreciate, it can t potentially open the door to more fans approaching the activity. Right. You just got to relate. <clears throat> yes. In order to communicate well, you have to relate. And if you do a show where you need to have voiceovers every 30 seconds just to bring people along, you're probably not doing that. It's different than like voiceovers telling a story and voiceovers for effect. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So if you had to say something about you know, keeping people in track with your show <clears throat> that might be needed for the effect. But in the end, if the plug gets pulled in the show, is it going to make sense? Are yeah. people going to care? You know, <clears throat> so you want to think about those things and make sure that your show can just connect with people. Cause that's, you know, when people think of an emotional connection, they're like, Oh man, they make you boo hoo. It's like, no, it's, not boohooing or tearing up. It's, you know, it's like, it's like, you just give a shit, you know, like <laughs> if something goes down, you know, day crescendos and it goes down to one player and you just hear bling on the glock and spill. And there's like a cool moment that happens visually that's coordinated and some thought went into it. Mm -hmm. Then that's an effect. You know, you just want to appreciate the coordination of those ideas. You know, are there, um, are there times where you and Matt, um kind of vibe back and forth like hey i want to do the battery stuff here first and then maybe we'll do the pit and then come back and adjust it versus i'm sure there's a lot of times where he does the front stuff first and then like you come back and add in like all right i wrote these accent points here for this auxiliary or accessory stuff um do you guys pick and choose those moments ahead of time or does it sometimes just be like happen more organically it's... sometimes things end up different than when we did originally in the sketch and that just either comes from hey there's too much going on here and it sounded great on Sibelius and the audio but once once we get it in a boomy gym with our tuning with you know a sound design that might be in the same range as the bass drums you know what I'm saying like there's there's a lot of things that you have to go in and like clear out in person sometimes mm -hmm. that you can't always catch um, in, in the audio, um, but yeah, I mean, but process. I wouldn't say, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say like concepts change particularly, but we'll definitely thin something out to where it's just snares and sound design, you know, something like that, where maybe had marimbas in there playing an ostinato first, but like, no, let's just take it out. Um, but we tried to triage that in the sketch in the timeline at first and that stuff. Cause in the timeline, I will have, <laughs> You know, hypothetically, snare, like, for instance, the Eminem thing is just snares and the sound design. I mean, I'm mean, sure the, the drum set plays during it, you know. Mm. So, like, just finding those moments that everywhere in the timeline. And that's the other thing in the timeline is I'm going through the music ideas. I'm making sure every one of those is a different presentation of the audio. So it might be bass drums and vibes that are the focus. The next one might be electronics and rack. You know, just kind of find different combinations for those isolated moments to bring those ideas to life. Because when you're being the same all the time, it's hard to be effective, you know? Um, and, and that's kind of where we try to find our effect is find the, finding the difference, creating contrast from idea to next. And, and well, it, keeps, it gives the show momentum from idea to idea. If something overstays its welcome and it's the same thing conceptually for a minute and a half of your show, the audience is going to be sitting there going, all right, where's this going? All right, what are, we, what are we doing? We've been hearing the same kind of stuff for a while. Like, where is this leading us to conceptually? So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and that has and, and that time frame has changed over time. Like I was yes. saying like earlier, it was like, we got to get 40 seconds to a minute or whatever. Now it's like... If you're not doing something in 15 seconds, then it doesn't be anything big and a bunch of shots. But as long as you're doing something interesting on the floor, that's engaging. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of times that has to do with the visual program more than the music. Because the music might 
make sense and be a horizontal phrase or a transition. And if you're just doing dots on a page and not creating a cinematic moment for people to look at, and when I say cinematic, I mean like, say you got five snares, three quads and five bases. You put the snares in a circle, maybe one of the quads is in the middle of the, of the snares and then the other two are out and the base is creating another arc around it. And then it's a down moment. You got a buzz pattern that goes through the whole group that carries that it ends with the one quad in the middle of the snares, right. like create that interesting art as if it was a full palette that you're drawing on and you're doodling on, mm -hmm. you know, like try to, no matter the numbers you have, you got two snares, two quads, four bases, doesn't matter. Like try right. to come up with something that is visually appealing to look at. Um, but in on and on that realm, like if you've got a smaller group, you need to spread them out more. You need to have more individual solos. You need to have, mm -hmm. I mean, just the contrast in what you have to do with like eight people on the floor versus like thirty. Like Mystique's, we got thirty people out there marching between the battery and you know the seven dancers. Mm -hmm. So it's just a lot, you know, big difference. Yeah, that's something but. else that's evolved recently in recent years of the activity of the amount of bodies on the floor. And then you add props to it. It's very easy for things to get cluttered. And you watch a show and go like, the floor is only a certain size. Drums take up a certain amount of space. You have the front in the whole front. Most of the time they're in the front of the floor. And it's like, then you add big props to it. And you have 10 visual ensemble members. And I'm like, this is hard to read just from people clutter. Even if the drill's clean, unless it's like a pristine, huge geometric figure you're rotating or something, there can be too much going on. And yeah, you can use the props to hide people visually and have them come on and off the floor, which is a good evolution, in my opinion, in a lot of cases. But yeah, you have to be really careful of cluttering too much and like really picking your moments to be not only we talked about musically digestible earlier, it's got to be visually digestible. Right. And kind of what you're saying earlier about how people's ears aren't really trained to decipher the top tier amongst mm -hmm. themselves you know, cause everybody sounds great. Right. That is a skill set, but one skill set that everybody has regardless is your eyes. Yeah. You can see stuff. So the moment you come onto the floor before you play a note, people judge you and you're either going to start at an advantage or start at a disadvantage with how you look, how your floors coordinated with your uniforms and your props. You know, if you come out looking like a million bucks and maybe don't play so well, you're already starting at an advantage mm -hmm. and you've, you've got some wiggle room to move up. Let's say you're an immaculate team and you come out in t-shirt and jeans cause your uniforms ain't in yet. And maybe nobody knows who you are or whatever. Like it's you're at it. You're at an upward struggle. You're in a, you're in a deficit that you got to take care of by your first note, <laughs> you yeah. know, yep. if it's going to be visual. So, cause when I work with a lot of younger groups that are really like they're, they're making their entry into the activity. Right. And the group is, you know, they can play okay, but the thing that they, I try to get them to focus on is how you look first. If you look good, you're going to, you're going to play good. You're going to feel good. So if your students come onto the floor and they got a cool floor, they got cool uniforms, they got props at work, they have, their confidence is already stronger, right? So, and no, and that's low hanging fruit. That doesn't take any education. Right. So like, like the, the better you can, you know, help these groups out with just being fundamentally prepared to get onto the floor and leave the education up to the instructors. Like that's, that's really a place where any group really wants to be. Right. So like all educators, you just want to worry about teaching your kids. You don't have to worry about that prop or floor or whatever mm -hmm. is happening. So. Um, is this, yeah. you mentioned the, uh, is this the first year you've had the mosh pit or like the visual ensemble? It is actually. So we... what was the driving factor to decide to implement that for this show? Was it like we have a necessity for representation from this type of uh, concept or how did that evolve? We've had interest over the years with people that wanted to do it. Um, and one of the things that kept us from doing it in previous years was not having anybody to teach it. Because we don't want to give some, you know, a, a new section coming in, you know, my advice and movement. It's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, I was like, we need to have somebody there that's qualified to do that. And, you know, an independent group that pays, you know, next to nothing, you know, is like, that's just what it is. So, like, luckily this year we, we've got a couple of talented instructors that are, have been a part of our group from the outside. And uh, it's it, it's worked out really well. Really good recruiting and 
uh, got some, like I said, some killer talent in, but that's the first catalyst. We had somebody to teach it. The second one is like, I needed somebody to pull these stanchions out and work these props and it wasn't going to be the battery. Um, cause some of the hardest things that a group can do is a transition to go take your drums off and get them back on. And we've done that a lot in the past and I, I think we're pretty good at it, but it's not something that I like to do, nor does the staff like to do it. It can be very forced. You know? Yes. Yeah, it, it can be. And if not, it's like, it has to be part of your design. Like it has to be like in a timeline and have purpose and, and just to avoid that, uh, like I just need more bodies, you know, that's, that's really it. Um, yeah. It's a fine line. You got to walk. I have as one... far as, go ahead, okay, sorry. go ahead, Mike. No, 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 no you're, you're good. good. Oh, okay. So I had one last question to bring us back. Yeah. It happens sometimes when there's a yeah, yeah, bunch of people good, talking, yeah. you know, too many, too many thoughts going through our heads, but to bring it back to this year's show real quick, you mentioned before you have all of those different homages you all pay to various things throughout different art mediums, musically that have pushed the boundaries and everything. How did you all come up with all the different things you wanted to pay homage to? Was it like you all just sat in a room one night, cracked a few beers, and just like threw stuff out there and see what people liked? Or did you all prepare ahead of time? Or you already had these in the back of your head as things you'd like to put in a show at some point when the show allowed it or required it? Like how did the, all the different moments or, or callbacks come about? Um, That's a good question. I think – I can't really remember that. I, I can say that the show, the red line came first mm -hmm. and it was, Hey, let's do something where we present different artists that have done certain things. Right. And we didn't limit it to just music. It was, like I said, the Elvis waist down choreography. It was the avant-garde of uh, Yoko Ono or John Cage. It was like, just whatever artists we could put out there, we didn't do any painting because it's just we try to find things that I could um, materialize on the floor, mm -hmm. and th that's a big one. So uh, whatever music we picked or moment, I wanted to make sure we could do something that could physically be tangible away in a design process that could present it the way that we needed. Like for instance, um, um. The Elvis one, like I had mentioned, I knew that we weren't going to be playing a lot of that music, but we could use it as an effect and some voiceovers about how he just did what he wanted. He didn't mm -hmm. care what anybody else thought. And we've got like a little segment in there about that as he starts to do kind of his, his leg movement and stuff. And um, yeah, I mean, I knew I wanted to be censor have stuff to do with censorship, things that uh merges people culturally kind of rejected it first i know there's the one quote in there about like exactly. you know oh this heavy metal music is kind of like satanic or devil music or something like it, that. yeah it's satanic it's a detriment to society it's like yeah. the whole intro is about the doom and gloom of all these artists presenting their their work and and how society just really kicked back um or certain parts of society did yeah and and just the fact that you know things are on the radio now that would not have flown 20 years yeah, ago. That's for sure. Yeah. Ago. That's for sure. You know, <laughs> right. But we're all comfortable with it. But at mm. some point, somebody had to cause that friction yeah. right. for that wall to come down, you know, or that red line to come down or to step over the red line just so that it, there, it brings a little bit of normalcy to everything. And, um, and that's really what we did. Like once we decided when to do the red line, we just went down and started making a list of all the things that were impactful of course, Rider Spring was the first one, right? Um, and then uh, we wanted to do some things with rap. We wanted to do some things with uh, female singers. We wanted to do some things that were avant-garde, uh, censorship on all levels, movement, voice, you know, just that kind of thing. Heavy metal. We, there's some heavy metal stuff that's actually... If you guys have seen the show, it comes after the Eminem stuff. It's like okay. the next thing. I've seen it once or twice it, so far. Yeah, I've watched a handful. I'm not sure if they'll be doing that this weekend at the regional. I don't know. I, th I think they're just still doing it through the Eminem stuff this weekend. Got to save some stuff. Yeah. You got to just like you know, you can't. Yeah. Well, I they've known the music for a little bit, but I just put the visual on last to the ending like last weekend, and uh, we didn't have time to clean it. We just learned it, and so we're just gonna focus on the other stuff but but yeah we, we got to save some nuggets for the ending and and uh and all that for sure 
Yeah. Is there anything um, that you feel like you want to say or want to put out there that people should be looking for? Or are you going to keep it? Um. No, I think the show speaks for itself. I I think we tried to be um creative with our choices and not on the nose with things. Mm-hmm. So I I think that we I think so far we've done a pretty good job with presenting those elements in a creative way that um hopefully by the end all the red lines are broken and and uh there's no more red on the floor that type of thing with the lights and the floor oh. not being red in spots and that type of stuff but it's, um that yeah, little nugget and, and you just gen- dropped right there of there's yeah. not going to be any more stuff red on to the look floor forward to. like yeah. i probably i always joke on myself that i'm not the i'm a drum i'm a snare head like i listen to the drumming music and the clarity that's what i focus the most this this podcast has actually made me look more big picture when i watch the activity now and i i like that but i'm still like blinders on sometimes i probably would have had to have had that pointed out to me about like oh there's no red on the floor anymore like do you get it they broke through the red line in the back so yeah it's really cool you just said that right there now i'll be i mean sure and in the end i mean i can say it because you're i mean everybody's gonna see it. it's not like we can hide it but like they're the four movable props that we have that are out there mm-hmm. like the rest of the props are not in any of the videos we've got eight more of those that go around the floor that mm-hmm. all light up Gotcha. But they're not going to move. They're just there. So we take those four and we put them on the right side. And then at the end of the show, we take those four and we move them across the floor as all the lights turn from red to other fun colors. We get to the cross the group because we start on the right side of the floor mm-hmm. on the red. We're going to move that over to the left and then we're going to pull the uh, the red floor over so it's all black and all the red lights turn other colors nice. and interesting we basically like move our bodies from red to, from one side to the other kind mm. of thing at the end so yeah from where they start yep exactly simple yep. uh ending that everybody can gravitate towards and digest hey they moved the red line how about that and uh um, makes sense yeah man because uh, you know, we're all guilty of it. We get all heady about our shows and we deliver this thing. And at the end we go, boom, applause for us. And there's not a lot of substance sometimes to the ending other than we played loud and we just ended it, you know? Yeah. Somebody's like, I have no idea what just happened. Yeah. It's like, I'm glad they're done playing. That's awesome. (laughs) I say all the time a show finishes and I see it for the first or second, second I watch or read of it. And I get look at Evan and go, I still don't know what the hell the show's about. (laughs) <laughs> yeah well it, sometimes it doesn't help when the show title is like a word that like you have to look up in the dictionary but that's all right <laughs> um but yeah yeah that doesn't help like if you've got to have people do, you know search for information or read a libretto <laughs> or like anything like that like it's not you've already lost <laughs> you know <laughs> like try try to do something else but you know but but I've been guilty. I mean, we're we're all guilty of it at some point because we want to create art sometimes, mm-hmm. right? Right. We want to create art for ourselves, and then we expect the fact that we're in world class, the quality of it will be the effect, you yeah. know, and yeah. and being cerebral, we're playing clean and all that, and then you can go into critique and tell the judges all the things that aren't on the floor and make them think that all that stuff exists uh, through critiques and stuff, and. I would just rather let the show speak for itself in the end. Yep. And mm-hmm. I think the way to do that is to make sure that your effects are pretty tangible in a way that um, um, people can connect to and relate to. And and if you're talking with them and critique about it and they got questions, at least you've got some, I don't know, some ground or have covered some ground to get to that point where they at least understood what you're doing. You know? Heck yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, we're just being judged on music playing, which is what everybody does. Yeah. Everybody plays well. Everybody moves well. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I actually really enjoyed that this kind of became not just, uh, you know, about this year's show, but just, you know, how to make things from your experience and your your opinion and how you've developed your craft over years just like you know almost like a clinic for some folks to listen to so hopefully some people can latch on to a couple things in there the somebody who's new to the indoor activity starting up or just some nuggets to grab onto as well as you know just 
hearing about the what you guys are putting down this year, which is I'm really looking forward to seeing in person. So yeah, me too. I mean, it, yeah. it really has been good. I also to second what he just said, I appreciate the design philosophy stuff because I know the initial idea for this kind of an interview or discussion was more about just this year's show, but I think it's good that we broaden the scope a little bit. There's there's plenty of stuff in the hour we've done about exactly an hour now in okay. there about this year's show like i'm gonna watch it next time and have a totally different perspective because i understand what's going on now you've broken down on some of the important ideas and concepts and i'll be looking for that when i watch it next and hopefully anybody that listens to this will have a deeper appreciation for it now too um but i i do think it's cool that it, that it evolved into more of a here's how we approach it big picture each season here's what we think works what doesn't work we try to do something different every year so yeah it was really cool and we just really appreciate you coming and giving us an hour of your time today and like just talking shop pretty much yeah man i like it i wouldn't mind come back some other time Got yeah. any other topics I'm, I'm always i love to talk so just, <laughs> well, just let me know i was we mentioned I totally we started recording. I, get a, I got a dune showing here in a little bit oh, so okay well we'll wrap this up here in a second that. so comment like subscribe on youtube if you're on podcast services or if you're on youtube already uh facebook instagram follow once again share this with any anyone you think would appreciate or get something out of it uh patreon.com slash age.podcast or the join button on youtube to support us financially and yeah we'll have you back on maybe we'll uh get together after the season's over and we'll watch the show with you like uh, yeah, we'll, we'll watch the final run multicam or something and talk about it a little, little deeper, but we'll see what happens. So again, sure. thanks Shane. This was freaking awesome. Awesome. Thanks guys. Yep. Peace.